Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kirsten Riley. I am the executive director of Naturally San Diego. We are very excited today, especially because not only do we have the, the SPINS team, we're joined by Benji and Allie, but this is our first joint Naturally San Diego, Naturally LA event. Um, Renee and I have been uh, chatting about it for a little while. So the SPINS team helped to make it happen and we're, we're talking about doing a happy hour coming up here soon. So be on the lookout for more joint Naturally LA, Naturally San Diego events. Um, as I mentioned, we're very excited to have the SPINS team here with us today. We're going to be talking all about promotions um, as, as you plan your promotions plan into 2024 and how to be really intentional when it comes to developing your promotions. Um, so Benji and Allie are going to talk all about that. Um, so feel free to drop questions in the chat as you have them as, as they're presenting. Um, and then we will save time at the end um, to, to run through all of the questions at once. And then obviously you can you know drop more questions in the chat at the end as well. But if you have a question and you're thinking about it, drop it in the chat um, as you have it. Um, so with that, I wanna introduce uh, Benji Fitz, who is the Director of Client Insights. And we have Allie Johnson, who is the Senior a Analyst of Client Insights. So I'll, I'll let them take it away. Awesome. Hey, guys. Nice to see everybody here. Um, really stoked to be able to talk about promotions. You know, what a better time to talk about it than now as everyone gets their promotional plan kind of set up for the new year. So I'm here with Allie. So um, let's uh, let me share my screen here. We're going to go through this deck. It's about 20 slides. Um, and then we're going to go through this. If you have questions, just chat them in. We'll probably get to them at the end, you know, and then we'll open up to a little bit more Q&A uh, at the end of the thing. So uh, can everybody see my screen all right? We all good? We all good. All right, cool. So um, let's do a little bit of interest here. Uh, like I said, my name's Benji. I am a director of Client Insights on our brand side of um, Spins. So I work with a lot of brands, you know, because uh, Spins, we also work with retailers and brokers and distributors and everybody in the whole ecosystem. But our specialty is brands, and that's where I um, really love to operate. Um, before I worked at Spins, uh, I spent a bunch of time at Whole Foods Market, and before that, I worked for a, a small tofu company on the East Coast. So let me hand it over to Allie. Tell us about you, Allie. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Allie Johnson. Um, I'm based out of the Denver, Colorado area. I've been with Spins for about a year and a half now. Um, supporting small and medium brands on our consulting side. Uh, prior to Spins, I was working for a CBD company based out of Boulder, where I did category management and also called on um, the West Coast, so the Air Wands and the Mother's Market of the World in your neck of the woods. Um, and prior to uh, Charlotte's Web, I was with the Kellogg company doing business planning, um, which kind of qualifies me to be able to talk to promotions today. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited to get into it. Awesome. Awesome. All right. You got some big brains on this call, guys. So let's drop it. Let's Thank go. You. <laughs> All right. So um, we work with a lot of different clients and a lot of different, you know, uh, segments of the industry. Right. You know, um, and the, the things that we kind of always hear from them, um, especially recently, are when it comes to promotions, what should I be looking at? Um, and am I wasting money? You know, like that's a huge burning insecurity that I feel like a lot of people have. Uh, but like, let's tackle that first one. What should I look at? Promotions, you know, they definitely have their own set of measures and metrics and variables, you know, that uh, kind of range from pretty obvious to sometimes a little arcane, right? You know, so we're going to go through some of those things today and give you a good grounding on the, you know, three, four, five, six things that you should be kind of monitoring when it comes to promotions. And secondly, am I wasting money? right? That's a big one. So, you know, if you're a brand, especially a smaller brand, you kind of get on the shelf somewhere, uh, you're going to get advice from like your broker or the retailer that you got into. And they're like, well, you know, I need some promotions from you. I need a little promotional plan. And you got to understand like that maybe the a retailer's uh, strategy and interests isn't going to 100% align with your strategy and interests, okay? You know, like, for example, I had a client uh, a while ago who um, they were doing um, 
uh, they were in a, a well-known Southern kind of retailer, you know, that's well-known for doing BOGOs, right? You know, and this company made rice. They made like 24 ounce bags of rice, okay? And um, the retailer kind of convinced them to do 10 BOGOs a year for bags of rice. Now, like, I don't know how much rice you eat, okay? <laughs> but that's a lot of rice, okay? You know, so, um, and you can see kind of from the results of this, like, crazy strategy that they had that it didn't really work out for them you know so let's talk about what success kind of looks like all right so as a smaller brand a medium brand your goal should be kind of gently stair-stepping your growth at a retailer or in a channel okay um i think a lot of people thought success was like more of a hockey stick you know but I think that the current thinking, and this is kind of backed up by a lot of things I've been hearing in the industry and at Expo East and things like that, is that you really want to be able to kind of gently stair-step your way up to prosperity, okay? And to do that, you really need to focus on new buyers, okay? Especially when it kind of comes to promotions, as opposed to having your current customers buy more of your stuff, right? You need to get more people buying your stuff. Basically, need to increase your market share, you know. And promotions are a great way to do this. It's not the only way to do it, but it's a big way to do it. Okay. And so, if you think about trending your sales over the course of a year, which we see in this chart visual here, you know, we start off at a kind of you know low baseline, right? But we kind of do three sets of promotions here, as you can kind of see. So the first promotion kicks off, kicks us up to a higher baseline. We put our stuff on sale. People are like, ooh, I wanted to try that. I've never tried that before. I used to buy brand X, but now I'm going to buy this brand because this seems new and interesting. So you get to drive trial, right? You know, new people introduced to your product. Hopefully they like it. Hopefully they stick around. In this model, we're assuming that they do. So you put your stuff on sale. It goes to a higher baseline during the promotion and then a little bit after the promotion. Then you stair step it up again. You put your products on sale again. You widen your net of potential customers. You drive even more trial. More people are introduced to your product and they understand it. They love it. They try it. They buy more of it. They buy it cons more consistently. Then you do the execute that promotion, kind of go quiet a little bit, and then you do it again and you do it again. And it's just a stair step. You don't ever really want to put your stuff on sale like for six months in a row. Okay. That just does not work out as a strategy. You want to figure out some methodical way of pulsing your promotions. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit more as we go on. So um, let's talk about some key metrics and variables that you really want to pay attention to when it comes to speaking the language of promotions. So when it comes to data and data providers, there are three, right, when it comes to food. So there's Nielsen, there's Circana slash IRI, that's their old name, um, and then there's Spins. And Spins, we partner with Circana. Okay, and Circana supplies us with conventional style data, right? Data from for the Mulo channel, for the food channel, for Kroger, for you know Walmart, whatever, right? So um, when it comes to like how granular that data can be from each provider, uh, when it comes to Spins data, Spins has proprietary re retailers and channels. So you've heard of like the Natural Channel before. That's like an aggregation of Sprouts and Erewhon and Fresh Time and Fresh Market and yada yada, all combined into one channel, right? You know, and that's you can only buy that from Spins, okay? Uh, similar to the way you can only buy Sprouts, a key account data from Spins, right? And when you buy those proprietary channels or retailers, whatever, um, we only capture TPR style promotional data. So TPR stands for temporary price reduction, okay? So sale, right? So that is what we're able to capture in natural style retailers. Now, when it comes to conventional channel retailers, um, like we uh, get, you know, like we partner with, with Circana. So we're talking Kroger, Albertsons, Banners, you know, Walmart, Target, that sort of thing. There, we're uh, able to discern a little bit more promotional types of activity. Um, and so that includes temporary price reductions, okay? But also things is um, called displays, features, features and displays, and special packs, uh, which we'll define in a second here. So it really depends on what retailer that you're kind of examining at the moment as to what you're able to kind of pull out of the data. But TPR is really kind of the main style promotional activity that we see out in the market. Um, and Circana is able to gather this information because they actually send like people to the stores 
to go say like, oh, Kroger has an end cap with like, you know, the Super Bowl stuff and chips on it. And they like record all that sort of, sort of stuff. They have people that like look at the sales flyers and record what's in that. So that's why you're able to get a little bit more granularity in those big accounts. Let me hand it over to um, Allison to talk about promotional types. So here we've got four different examples of different promotional types that can be ran. So as Benji mentioned, TPR is essentially just a price reduction. So in syndicated data, we have a good idea of what your base ARP is. And any time that that is pulsed, we mark that as a TPR. We also have special packs. These are things like buy something, get something with it. Typically is its own custom UPC. Um, and this is really done more so in like the conventional space. Um, and then finally features and displays. So features is something that is in um, like a circulator or um, is like an ad. Um, it can also be something like a digital coupon online, like Sprouts has a really great digital coupon um, in their app. And then finally displays. So displays is anything that was sold in a secondary location. And again, features and displays are typically in just the conventional data um, because Circana and um, Nielsen have those auditors that go into store and see what features were ran this week for this um, retailer. And then, you know, where, where in the store were these products located? And then when you have feature and display together, that's typically referred to as quality merch. Um, you can have either or, and when you have both, that's that's like the highest quality promotion you can get to drive the highest awareness and typically where you see some of, some of the greatest lift. Awesome. Yeah. Um, just to reiterate though, most promotional activity is done by TPR. You know, features and displays definitely have additional costs that are super dependent on the retailer in which you're participating in, you know, but they can be kind of a pretty effective in some instances, you know, it depends on like the product and uh, the retailer and all that. So let's kind of move on to what sort of measures that you should be looking at when it comes to promotional data. Um, so as Benji mentioned, what should we be looking at? So when you're looking at promotional metrics, it can get pretty overwhelming pretty quickly because there's several ways to kind of slice and dice um, all of the different metrics that we have in our database. Um, so here we've kind of provided a good blue book of what KPIs you should be looking at when evaluating your promotions that really give you the best picture of your performance. Um, so one thing to note is that all of these things happen at the same time for one promotion, and they kind of tell different parts of the story. So the first bucket is quantity, and this is what volume actually scanned through the register on promotion. So this is referred to as promoted volume and non-promo volume. So how much stuff was actually sold at a discounted price? The overlaying metrics of promo and non-promo are your base and your incremental volume, which really tells us the quality of the promotion. So what amount of that promoted volume was truly incremental to your everyday business? And a key part of that is the subsidized volume, which is something we'll touch on in an example in the following slides. But this essentially tells us what amount of volume sold on our promotion that was not incremental, um, therefore would have sold at a regular price anyway. And this metric is important to monitor um, to make sure that you're not wasting trade spend. And then finally, the result, which is your percent discount. So this tells us if your retailer truly honored that 20% OI that you ran with. Uh, maybe it was deeper in some stores, maybe shallower. And then finally, the lift tells us how impactful the promotion was, which is on the following slide. Love it. Yeah. So base incremental and subsidized, just plainly put, base is what we think you would sell normally, right? You know, that's what we're kind of calculating out. This is normally in a week. Eh, this is what you're selling. Incremental is, if you have a sale going on, this is going to be all the new money that is the result of that sale, right? Incremental, great, love it. But there's always going to be some sort of subsidization, right? You know, and subsidized volume is basically, I was going to buy your product anyway, but it was on sale, so I got a better deal, you know? And you can't avoid that, right? There's no getting around it. But you can do things to limit it, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, all right, 
Let's move on to Lyft. Um, so Lyft, as Ali mentioned, is basically the, the uh, impact of a promotion. Um, it, Lyft is calculated by taking your incremental sales and dividing your base sales and multiplying by 100, okay? And the thing about Lyft is there's no, like, magic number, like I said here, you know, that is the perfect amount of Lyft. It's all really relative. Um, you know, is is 1,000% Lyft good? Well, does your competitor have 10,000% Lyft? <laughs> it's all relative, you know, but it's a really good number to be able to compare. So not only can you compare Lyft numbers between like weeks of your own promotion to see maybe if there was especially juicy week there, you know, but you can compare Lyft numbers between your own set of promotions. So say you had a promotion in January, had 50% Lyft, you had a promotion in December that had 150% Lyft. Obviously that one was better. So, you know, figure out why, right? But um, it's a really just good comparative metric that you should be able to calculate um, and see the difference um, in between uh, what's going on. So let's move over to um, looking at product groups. Okay, so let's talk about soda for a second, right? If you're a soda company, let's say you make, you know, two liters. Okay, you make, you know, 12 ounce cans, six packs, 12 packs. You make those little tiny cans, right? That are great for cocktails, you know? <laughs> uh, you make a variety of different products, right? You know? And as a company that does that sort of thing, you probably have uh, different goals for those sets of products, right? You know, like maybe this year you really want to promote your uh, your small can business versus your two liter business, which is very, you know, very solid. And so most companies with a wide portfolio of products they don't do what's called line drives, right? Where everything's on sale at the same time, you know, for the same discount level, right? Um, they segment up their products and, you know, promote them kind of like uniquely, right? And if you have a company, if you have a business, you probably have a very good understanding of your own product portfolio. I would hope you would, right? You know, so it's easy to kind of be able to segment and look at your promote or your product groups very easily for your own business. But when it comes to the competition, and like I said earlier, you want to like look at not only your own lift numbers, but the competition's lift numbers. Sometimes it's kind of difficult to um, group together their items and see how they're promoting their own product groups. Okay. So one thing that Spins does that makes building product groups easy for not only your stuff, but for the competition is um, we have like a huge array of attributes that are coded for all of the items that we track, right? We code for, you know, pack count, size, organic, yada, 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 right? And using these attributes, you can quickly kind of filter down, um, you know, to build product groups for your competition. So in this example, if we, let's say we're a chocolate bar company, and we wanted to look at, um, you know, how our competition is doing in terms of promoting their chocolate bars, uh, what we would do first is we would download all the chocolate schemes. So if we're looking at conventional data for uh, shelf-stable candy chocolate, it's 10,000 SKUs right? It's a lot. Um, so what we would do next is, let's say, you know, we wanted to look at bars that were like organic, right? And a certain size. We would use our product types to filter out all the, you know, coins and, you know, uh, non-bar type items and things like that. Get rid of all that stuff. And instantly we're down 80% in terms of SKU counts. So now we're at 2,000 SKUs. Next, we would go to organic if we want to look at just organic stuff. And we could filter out all the conventional stuff. Now we're down to 700 SKUs. Finally, we would use like size, you know, to get rid of like the novelty items, the huge bars of chocolate, right? Get rid of all that stuff. And now we're left with 500 SKUs. And then we could kind of more, much more easily build product groups for the competition based on those parameters, right? Now, when it comes to um, not just the metrics, you also need to learn the variables when it comes to promotions. What are the key levers of um, promotions, uh, you know, when it comes to examining them? And there's really about three, okay, simply put, right? So in this instance, um, and this is pulled from Satori, which is our business intelligence tool. So we're looking at, you know, a, a mask brand here, and we're looking at the promotions over the course of, uh, I think, two years. And every time you see like a bump, you know, it's like a heartbeat, right? Every time you see a bump, there is a promotion. So it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven promotions in here, but we're gonna pull out three and examine them a little bit more closely. So we have three ranges that we've identified. We have the blue range, 
we have the yellow or orange range, and then we have the purple range, okay? So in range one, um, we pull that out and we see that had 190% unit lift. Wow, killer, awesome. And it had $43,000 of incremental dollars. Okay, pretty good, all right. Let's compare it to something else. Uh, we have range two, that had a lot less unit lift, still good, se seemingly, but it had more incremental dollars. Huh, that's weird. And then third, we see this tiny promotion here, didn't have a great unit lift, didn't have really great incremental dollars. So what's what's going on with these three promotions? So there's three main variables that you wanna consider when you're looking at promotions. There's time. How long did the promotion last? Pretty easy. There's execution or distribution of the promotion. And then there's the discount level. So if we look at the time for all these promotions, it's between seven, eight weeks. So distinction without a difference there. That's pretty same, same. So we're going to say that variable is more or less constant when it comes to this. Okay, so that wasn't the key driver of, of how effective these were. What about the execution? So if we look at these numbers, so we have the max ACV, any promo for these three promotions. So simply put, max ACV is a number that goes from zero to 100, okay? If it's 100, that means it happened at 100% of stores. If it's a 50, it happened at half the stores, you know, that sort of thing, right? So we see that first promotion had 87% of the stores participating. That's not bad. The second one had 94, even better. Love that. And the third one had 63%. That's pretty bad. <laughs> and probably contributed to the third promotion not being so effective. Now, the thing is, is like, Execution of promotions, there's a lot to unpack there that the data can only kind of hint at, right? You know, so, I mean, I used to work at Whole Foods Market. I worked at the store level, the regional level, the global level, right? You know, and like, it is very easy for some clumsy customer to come into your store and elbow the shelf, sale shelf tag right off the shelf, and then it's gone forever, or at least for a week, right? And then that promotion basically never happened to that store because people weren't aware of it. You know, you could have stocking issues, you could have price tag issues, you could have, you know, distribution issues. Um, you could also, in some instances, you know, only be participating in a, a certain region of a retailer, which would affect this number too, right? You know, so there's a lot of variables that can kind of affect the execution and distribution of your promotion. And a third lever, honestly, one of the bigger ones, is kind of like how, how steep or cheap is this discount, right? So we see... The first discount, um, we have two numbers here. We have like kind of the promo price, which is a little bit of a blend. Um, and then we have the discount level, which is also a blend. So the first one, about 45% off. That's pretty deep. Second one was 30% off, and the third one was 11% off. So what I'm seeing here is the third promo was bad because a lot of stores didn't do it, and it wasn't really a very good sale. I mean, 10 11% off, wouldn't even get out of bed for that, right? This, the other two promotions, though, something interesting is kind of happening here. Um, so they had relatively, well, they had the same amount of time. They had more or less the same amount of execution. But the first promo went a lot deeper from, than the second promo. So because the first promo, they had 45% off, the unit lift was way higher, but the incremental dollars was a little bit lower. And the second one was a little bit cheaper, 30% off. So their unit lift was still pretty good, still higher, but still high, but their incremental dollars were more effective. So depending on your objective, one promotion could have been better than the other one. Okay, so let's dive into that a little bit more. Here's an example where we have two different styles of promotions, okay, A and B. And I want you to think about the, A is, we're going to, um, it's it's a cheaper promotion. A is trying to be cash efficient. And B, they are going really deep in the deals here, real deep in the discounting. They want to really um, drive market share or, or velocity, okay? So here, you know, we see in promotion A, reg price is three bucks. They went on sale for two bucks, 33% discount. They drove 4,000 incremental units and they had 300% lift. All right, that's not bad. Now you can kind of normalize comparing promotions a little bit by dividing your lift number by your discount number. So you get nine points for the first one. And for the second one, base regular price was three bucks, promo price, buck 50, pretty deep. 
Um, and they drove 4,000 or 5,000 incremental units, you know, so they had 400% lift. So if you divide the discount by the, the lift by the discount, you get eight points, right? So the point is here, which one was better, all right? If your objective is to be cash efficient or protect your margin, A was a better choice. If your goal was to grab market share, drive velocity, protect your brand from competition pressure, B probably could have would be maybe the better choice. And the thing here is like, when you're a new brand getting onto a shelf for the first time, you might wanna seriously consider B style promotions, okay? Because they will cost you more money, but the whole point, like we saw on the first slide is you need to attract more and more buyers, right? Consistently over time. And by just kind of doing, you know, a promo that's 10, 15% off, not really going to drive a lot of lift, but you're just checking a box for a retailer because they told you to put their stuff on sale. Who are you benefiting? You're probably not benefiting your own brand. You're probably benefiting the retailer a little bit more, right? So again, every circumstance is different and the cost of promotions varies widely. But when you're kind of penetrating a retailer for the first time, I would have you seriously consider trying to go deep and grab market share um, versus trying to be cash efficient. Okay, let's go uh, move on to a case study here that Allison's gonna run us through. Awesome, thanks, Benji. So here we've got an example of a promotional analysis that we did for one of our clients who's in the dips and hummus space. And this is just a really great kind of templated example of what we can do, how we partner with our clients to answer some questions that they have where they don't really know anything about what is happening with their promotions. So in this case, our client is relatively new to this retailer. So they're looking for, you know, what is the category doing? How are some of our key competitors promoting? And how do we stack up against those key competitors? So... Starting off with a brand ranking here, we always want to look at what's happening at the high level brand performance um, across all the KPIs to get really a, a broader picture of what's going on. So here we've got the top 10 brands um, in our client, and we can see what's happening with volume, distribution, pricing, and velocity. And the key columns to focus on here are the two on the right-hand side, which is showing us how much dollars are sold on promotion. And right off the bat, in Dips and Hummus, we can see that there's a varied strategy across a lot of these top brands. So brands C and D are two key competitors of our clients. We can see they're both driving double-digit volume growth, double-digit velocity growth, and they're taking very different approaches. So brand C sells nearly half of their dollars on promotion, and brand D doesn't promote at all. And our client is somewhere in the middle of that. So what is happening here? Um, what can we dig into to understand, you know, what are these brands doing that, that we can learn from and take into our planning season? So here we're looking at those key quantity and quality metrics that we spoke to in the beginning. So at the top, we can see the promoted volume, which is the amount that actually scanned through the register at the discount. And at the bottom, we can see the quality. So the true incrementality of these promotions to their brand. So right off the bat, we can see brand C, who's that key competitor. We know that 47%, nearly half of their volume is sold at a discounted price and they promote more than any other brand in this space today. Um, whereas our client on the bottom, we can see drives the highest incrementality at 24%, which is higher than the subcategory average, which is that column that's on the right side. Jeez, no. So off the bat, we can see that this is, this is a great story for us because we know that we're somewhere in the middle in terms of where, how much we sell on promotion, but in terms of the quality of our promotion, we, our client is at the top of the list here. So this is great news, but there is a missing piece here, which is that subsidized volume piece. So as I mentioned previously, subsidized volume is a key metric to keep an eye on to make sure that you're not wasting money, right? One of those key questions we get from clients a lot is, am I wasting money 
on promotions. Um, so as Benji mentioned, you can never get rid of subsidized volume. There's always gonna be some sort of subsidized volume there unless you're just simply not promoting at all. Um, but the key here is to compare that subsidized volume against what the category is doing and what our key competitors are doing in order to you know, find those efficiencies and really refine our promotional plan to, to limit this amount that is subsidized. So on this slide, we can see off the bat that brand C is wasting cash money. So they're selling about a third of their volume at a discounted price that would have been sold anyway at a regular price. Um, so a great way to kind of visualize this that Benji reminded me of was one of our clients who sells queso. And they were promoting queso during Cinco de Mayo, which lots of people are going to be buying queso at a full price anyway. Um, so they're they're basically giving away that queso at a discounted price when people would have bought it at a higher price. So that was not maybe the most efficient way to allocate trade spend, right? So maybe not promoting queso during peak seasons would really help them eliminate their subsidized volume here. So we can see that our brand um, headed in blue here is right on par with the subcategory average in terms of subsidized dollars. 15% um, subsidization is less than a lot of these top brands, except for the ones that don't promote that often, um, while driving almost four times the incrementality of the total category. So our client is, is really killing it here and they're new to the space. They're, they're the number 10 brand. So they're not the share leader, but something that they're doing with their promotions is really driving great effectiveness. So what are they doing so well? So at the top um, bump part is our client's brand. And we can see that um, in the beginning, they kind of didn't really promote that much. They ran one deep promotion. And then more recently, in like the last six months, they've been pulsing some promotions as well. Um, on the bottom bump part, we can see Brand C, who's that competitor promotion that sells half of their volume on promo. And off the bat, you can just see that they run long-term promotions. So what does this tell us? Um, there are two different theories at work here. Our client promotes less frequently for short durations at a deeper discounted price. You can see on the left here, 40% um, was their most effective discount. Their highest lift was 175%, which was for that one week promotion. Um, while brand C has a different approach to their strategy here, they promote longer term at a less steep discount um, and this is where they're losing some of that quality of their promotion. So in this scenario, we can see based on lifts that our clients' deeper, shorter term promotions are more effective and is what's really driving that incrementality piece. So this was helpful for them to understand because Brand C is a key competitor. They are a share leader. They're driving incredible growth. Um, but this kind of ensured our client that they're doing the right thing when it comes to promotions. And this can inform their, their planning season, right? So for next year at this retailer, instead of discounting at 24%, like Brand C did for 11 weeks, the way to really drive that um, incrementality to the category would be to do a little bit of more of these deep pulses and promotions. So from here, we can dig into a lot of different things, but this is kind of a great like blueprint of answering those high level questions like what's happening or is what we're doing working and what can we learn from our competitors? And then from here we can double click, right? And we can look into different promoted groups um, or different retailers that are competitors of this retailer to see kind of how those promotions compare. Absolutely, I love that. You know, um, sometimes, I mean, as a brand, sometimes it's hard, you know, to make the decision to go like really steep with a discount, you know, but it, it can surprisingly pay off depending on the category. The other day I was at Sprouts um, and Olipop was on sale. So, you know, $2.50 can of soda, right? $2.99 in some places. And they had a sale that was three for six, like a, a Trogo, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow. And like, that 
you know, that got in my head. I bought like nine of them, you know? So like, it was an amazing sale, right? And I'm sure it'll kind of pay off in the numbers there. It really depends on the product, the category, the everyday pricing and stuff like that. But um, another brand that kind of does that sort of strategy is Rayos, Passos, usually 10 bucks at the store, but every now and then it's like $5.99 for jar or they have, you know, two for seven or something like that. They drive huge amounts of volume when that happens, you know? Um, and gain a lot of share and, and worked out for them. Now this slide, it should probably like, we're, we're going to send this deck out, um, print this out. Okay. So this is going to be your basically um, flow chart on like what's, what you should do when you do a promo. Okay. First of all, you do a promo, get some data. You end up looking about how it's doing. Is it doing good? Is it doing bad? Let's just talk about the, you know, the flow chart here. Let's say you like what it's doing. The lift is good, okay? Compared to what you've done in the past, compared to the competition, keep it up. So if you're getting good uh, return on investment, you know, um, then that's awesome. You should probably just maintain your promo strategy. It's working for you. Maybe prune it a little bit like a rose bush, but, you know, just keep it kind of going. Um, but, you know, another thing you should do if you're kind of like outperforming competitive brands or you're really concerned about the competition because it could be a very competitive space, just make sure that you're monitoring the other brands as well, you know, just to make sure that they're not going to come out of left field and like hit you over the head with something you weren't expecting. Now, on the other side here, if your promos aren't driving enough lift, there's a couple like key reasons that you should kind of look at here. Well, if you're losing money on these things, then evaluate your depth of discount. Maybe you're just kind of being a little too cautious about how much you're discounting your stuff. Take a look at competition, see how deep they're going and what the lift result would be. Um, another thing could be maybe people don't know your stuff's on sale, you know, so then you could kind of consider doing like marketing efforts or ad placements or features and displays, you know, that sort of thing, reallocating your dollars in some other vehicle here. Um, and then next would be if you're really suffering from subsidization, right? You know, if you are that queso company and, <laughs> and you're like, why? What, what is going on with this high subsidization number? And, you know, really look at like the seasonality of kind of what you're, of when you're promoting, when, when you think people would naturally buy your products, don't put it on sale, you know, are Christmas trees on sale in December? No. Is cold medicine on sale during the holiday? No. Is cold medicine ever on sale? No. Right. You know, don't do that. Right. There's some products that, um, Maybe you don't need to promote it. And, and there's a lot of products. There's certain times of year where you really just don't need to promote because people will buy them naturally. So just make sure you're looking at your promo window and you're looking at the competition. So to wrap it all up, three little bits of advice before we get into Q&A. Be intentional. You know, I mean, when I first got my job in the natural food industry, I worked for a tofu brand, had a broker, great guy, loved him, still love him. And... um you know, had like worked with UNFI, you know, and like all these people were kind of telling me, oh, you need to do OIs and MCBs four times a year and yada, yada. And um, I was like, I'll just do whatever you say. And, and like that was fine, but it never really had the impact that I wanted a sale to have. We were never able to stair step and get those new buyers because the stuff that they promote right off the bat, you know, these these retailers, these distributors, whatever, um is you know oh, 10 15 percent off eh, that's no way he's getting out of bed for that you know so just be really intentional about what you want if you really want to gain buyers commit to it you know say hey this is my goal this is the kpi that i'm going to look at you know um I, I, am i going to be cash efficient this year because i have capital you know concerns or do i really just need to go for it if you're going to go for it go for it right but commit to that um, and also, if especially if you've been a brand who's been hanging around for a couple of years, switch it up, please. Don't put your promos on like autopilot. I mean, Allie, you told me a little bit. Tell me your thing about Kellogg's a little bit. Yeah. So as a business planner, account manager, it can be so easy to copy and paste the plan that you did last year, right? Because you're you're lapping the crap, as they say. Like you want your you go on sale in January. You're going to want to make sure that you you lap that January volume you did last year. Um, but really, consumers are smart. Like they get used to when your brand goes on sale if they're a loyal customer, and they'll wait to to pantry load 
when you go on sale. So copying and pasting your plan just to lap what you did last year can actually be less efficient. Um, and, you know, trade budgets usually shrink year over year. So you've got to get smarter with the way that you spend your money. Um, so doing this sort of analysis or partnering with somebody like Spins to tell you which promotions work best and which ones you don't have to just keep copying and pasting year over year, like a four week, 20% OI um, can be really helpful and beneficial to, to saving money and, um, you know, driving overall growth, growth to your brand, where it's kind of throwing the consumer off or they're not used to buying pantry loading when they're used to seeing your brand on sale. So that goes back to the being intentional piece because um, planning is a very important part of, you know, how your brand executes in retail. Absolutely. I mean, when, when's the best time to put your stuff on sale before the competition puts their stuff on sale, right? You know, that's what you want to do. And some of these brands I've worked with them. We have lots of them who, you know, they're just like, Oh, Let's do the same thing. I was like, I haven't changed my promo strategy since 2014. I had a brand tell me that. <laughs> you know, that's not good. Okay. You know, um, because like the competition, like in what nine years, the competition will learn what you're doing and then they'll just run circles around you. So be a little unpredictable, you know, be smart about it though. I mean, like, look at your promo plan. I did four promos last year. This one was the best one. These two were okay. This one stank. Cut that one, you know figure out something else, right? You know, and make it work better next time around. That's the simplest thing you can do, okay? Uh, last two here, um, number two, pick the best promo type. You know, like I kind of mentioned earlier, we didn't go hugely into displays and features and stuff like that, but depending on your retailer, um, you know, those may be an option. And sometimes in some retailers, they, you know, perform better than others, you know? So like, let's say at Publix, you know, people tend to look for BOGO style deals, right? Um, so, just kind of learn what what sort of uh, vehicle is performs the best um, at a retailer, and then kind of put your money into you know, one of those vehicles, right? And lastly, you know, if you kind of want like a schematic on how frequently to like look at this stuff, um, this would be if you could do these three things, you're going to be ahead of like ninety percent of everybody else, including maybe co-ogs a little bit. <laughs> so I mean, like just on a monthly basis. Make sure you're looking at your store level data, your market level data, and you're seeing like, okay, this is tracking with what I put out the plan, right? Um, because, you know, there's a lot of hitches in the giddy up here where you you agree on a promo with a retailer and then for whatever reason, it doesn't quite happen, you know? So and that can be, at, um, you know, multiple different levels. So store level data can be really handy there to make sure that you're seeing like lifts and, you know, consistent execution among stores. And if you're not, you can pass it on to your sales team or your brokers and say like, hey, get out there and fix this. Second, you know, make sure you're looking at this quarterly and are you hitting those lift targets that you set? How comparatively, you know, how are you looking versus the competition? Take a look. And then lastly, like I said, over and over, change and adjust your strategy. Don't put it on a, autopilot, you know, learn something from last year and make it better. Simple advice. So with that, Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll be sending out this deck. And uh, I believe we got, oh, we are just one minute over our schedule. We got plenty of time for Q&A. So uh, throw it out there, guys. Can I throw out the first question? Hit me, Mark. Let's, let's go. Right. Hi, Benji. Hi. Hey, Ali. Um, so oh, I'm I'm struggling a little bit with some of what you've shared today. And I'm going to try to phrase this in a way that you can respond. Okay. <laughs> but what really matters is post-promotional lift <clears throat> and that you're actually winning new consumers to the table. And what I'm hearing your say, you say here is for emerging brands that really need to build visibility and new consumers for their product, better to go deeper and win those consumers. But in the end, you have to look at ROI. So by going deeper, if you're, you know, your annual plan currently is, let's say a 20% trade spend, 30, 35% net margin as a result, and you're going to go a lot deeper, how do you justify that if that puts your trade spend at 35% and then your ROI at 20%? And I want to kind of 
put this in the context of something you said, Benji, which was the Olipop example, because the Trogo seemed to me to have the opposite effect of what a brand would want. You said, oh, I went and bought nine cans. Well, it's just like UNFI doing four buying. <laughs> if the consumer is going to four buy, and then you don't have any sales when you're off promotion for the next three months, does that really benefit you? Yeah, you know, like that's a really good point. I love that you brought that up. You know, like, and I want to caveat this by saying, like, every category is incredibly different, right? You know, like beverages, traditionally a very high velocity category, can be remarkably different from diapers or something, right? Or candy bars, even, right? You know, so I think it's good to just get a good grounding on kind of what everybody else is doing, you know, in a category, and then. Um, from that, you can see who's successful. Like we kind of saw in Allie's example, you know, like we had two brands there that one was like promoting really, really deep. One wasn't promoting at all, you know? Okay, that's interesting, right? So who's right in this instance, you know? Um, and being what's right, there's so many factors on what's right, you know? And there's so much... So much of it has to do with like your company's own financials, how much runway you think you kind of have, you know, how smart you want to be with your trade spin. I mean, you can burn really, really bright and um, then flame out. I mean, you know, we're seeing that happen, right? You know, but there is like this sort of level of perception with getting new customers that you need to pierce somehow, okay? And promotions are just one tool in the toolbox to do that, you know? Like another strategy could be something like that's more marketing based. Like let's launch a drink with Jake Paul and KSI, <laughs> you know, like, right. You know, there is a lot of different tools that you can use and they have variable costs, you know, and pluses and minuses to all of them, you know? So the advice that we're kind of throwing out there today, obviously the most important thing for any business is maintaining your bottom line. You know, um, but I have just personally seen a lot of brands where they kind of treat promotions like a pure afterthought. And um, that is not the best play in a lot of circumstances. I would also say, Mark, that's a great question. I'm so glad that you asked that because we are, as a salesperson, as a planner, you are held to a budget. Um, and I would say you don't know what you don't know. So if you've consistently done 20% off for four weeks and you're looking to, to um, drive higher ROIs, run a BOGO, run a TROGO if you must to like see how it works. And I'll give an example. When I was at Charlotte's Web, we were killing it with gummies. So CBD gummies, um, this was actually at Mother's Market and our 30 count gummies were performing pretty well, but we just launched six count gummies. So Doing a BOGO on six count gummies spent a lot of money for us, but it resulted in higher lifts and it wasn't the greatest ROI for a promotion, but those consumers that tried the six count gummies ended up trading up into the 30 count gummies and building that business, which we didn't promote as frequently. So the blended ROI and the blended margin that, that we lost there ended up being efficient long-term. But to do like BOGO's month, like once a quarter BOGO, maybe not so much. You might be wasting money there. But giving it a shot and, you know, asking your revenue people if we can try this promotion to see what happens. Um, if it's not a good ROI, maybe don't do it again. But it is at least worth, worth a try to see how those promotions actually perform because every category and even different retailer formats might react differently to a deeper promotion. So real quick follow-up question to that then, because if you're going to go deep, let's say you're going to do a BOGO, how do you know if you're just not setting uh, the table for consumer expectations to only buy at a very aggressive price point, as opposed to when you go back off promotion and now instead of $3, you're $5.99? And how do you know your consumers aren't going to say, well, that's just really expensive. I'm not going to spend that kind of money on it. I'll wait until the next promotion. That, that's a great question. 
I mean, like, it really depends on the product and like what you're putting out there. And I'd say that's very brand dependent, you know, like you don't want to maybe get in the habit of being a brand that goes deep repeatedly all the time. You know, like there's, there's gotta be a, uh, you don't want to go too frequent with these kind of promotions. Like, like the rice example, 10 BOGOs a year, you know, how did that pan out? The way we were able to measure if that panned out. It's simple. I mean, you're looking at kind of like your base set, uh, sales, your base volume over time. And if it's trending up, you're doing something right. It's trending down, stop what you're doing and reevaluate. You know, that's kind of what it comes down to. And I would say BOGOs and deeper discounts. If your goal is to drive trial, um, drive awareness of you being in that retailer, that's when that really makes sense. Like do a one-time we're trying to get more consumers aware that we're in store here, maybe do a dump in or something of the sort, um, but not frequently so that they get used to that price point. So, but if your goal is to drive trial, that deeper price point could be really, really beneficial. So it might make more sense early on when you get launched into a retailer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, you only get one chance to make a first impression, right? <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else? Question? All right. Well, we'll be sending out this deck later, but um, uh, so expect an email from uh, from uh the naturally network about that but if you guys do have any questions that kind of come up you know maybe you're going to marinate on this a little bit um ali and me are both on linkedin you know just shoot us a message you know in the last page of the deck we have our email address uh for growth at spins.com if you're interested in like learning more about solutions from spins but if you want to connect with ali or me you know just kind of like spitball something you know we're happy to do that ali and me we we work with a lot of small brands a lot of medium brands some big brands too and we have a lot of perspective about the industry. And I think the one thing that we love to do is just kind of share that perspective with folks, you know? So, you know, hit us up, let us know what you're thinking and uh, we can kind of continue this conversation. Hey, uh, well, thank you guys. Can everybody hear me? Um, I want to thank uh, Spins for having this for us and also uh, Benji and Ellie for being this this morning. It was very um Keep in mind, everybody, you're going to be getting an email from us that has the recording of this uh, webinar also, so you can watch it again. Um, and also, uh, SPINS is offering a list-off bundle for everyone who attended the webinar today. Um, more information is going to come in that email with uh, what that entails. And if you guys have any questions, you can send them to me or Kirsten. Um, and thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and have a great rest of your Wednesday. Halfway through the week, everyone. Do this. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Thank you.